The Craig Folly Show on Deadline Detroit is made possible in part by Lynette's Shrimp House, located in Highland Park. It's Metro Detroit's premier destination, serving juicy fried shrimp, fish, and wings, alongside soul food sides and new additions to the menu, like turkey tacos and desserts. Located at 13548 Woodward in Highland Park, just north of the Davidson, Lynette's is open for takeaway, noon to 8, Tuesday and Thursday, noon to 10 p.m. Friday and Saturday, and noon to 5 p.m. on Sunday. Call now, get some Lynette's. Hello, everybody. Happy Friday. Welcome to the Craig Folly Show on Deadline Detroit. It is Friday, 1135-ish or so on a Friday. We try to start this as close to on time as we can, but, you know, things happen. Either way, that means it's time for another episode of The Week That Was on Deadline Detroit. This is our panel discussion show. We like to have a little bit of fun while we do it, and I always bring in some wonderful guests to help me tell you what's going on out there. Alan Lengel and Nancy Derringer of Deadline Detroit are the staples of this program. We appreciate them both being here. Thank you very much. Always great. And uh, I've always had this roster of, of guests that we like to bring in. And one of my favorites is Susan Demas. She's the editor at the Michigan Advance, michiganadvance.com, where I learn a ton about things that are happening at the state capitol in particular. Hello, Susan. Hello. And also, we have welcome back to Dave Frasetto. It's been a little while. He goes back to the days when we were filming inside the Buell Bar downtown. Dave Frasetto, of course, is the owner of the Lexington, a new bar, uh, which is, well, it's not that new. It's about a year now, but with COVID, it's pretty new, right on Trumbull in the Woodbridge neighborhood. Uh, Dave, welcome back. It's a pleasure to see you. Thanks, man. I'm uh, I'm still shooting in a bar, so. Yeah, <laughs> well, there you go. Well, you know, I was thinking about that. We could move it over there one of these days because it is a lovely spot, and they've got a great patio on the back. I can't recommend it enough. It's really, really cool addition to the scene over there in that neighborhood, which has seen some really cool little developments happening. Anyway, before we get to everything this week, including our Schmucks of the Week much later on in the program and get to all the news, my friend Nancy Derringer has a story she would like to regale us. Okay. With. Okay. And I promise it has a point and I'll make it as quick as possible. It will not be like one of Langles. Okay. This story, <laughs> uh, this, story, this uh, I used to work with this young woman who was this real spark plug, just a, a just a, a little fairy sprite of fun and energy. And so this is really her story, but she's not here. So I'm going to tell it. So she's walking to, uh, so she's, she's going uh, to work on a Monday morning and she leaves her apartment in her high-rise downtown Detroit um, building, gets in the elevator. Um, there's an older man in the elevator with her and, you know, they nod hello, the Monday morning hello, and they ride down. And the elevator doors open and she's, he goes after you and she steps out of the elevator and he goes, oh, excuse me, miss, I think you dropped something. And she turns around and he is holding a pair of her panties in his hand. Now, <laughs> they are not, they are not the panties that she was actually wearing. Um, and she said, and what's worse, they were what she called Saturday night panties. So anyway, it was like a really mortifying moment for her. And it, it flashed through her head. What had probably happened um, was that she had done the laundry the night yes. before. And these were stuck somehow to her, the skirt she was wearing and had come loose in the course of this elevator ride. And so I said, well, what'd you say? She goes, oh, that's okay. Finders keepers. And I said, Haha, what did you really say? And she said, I turned about 500 shades of red and I just took the panties from him and stuck him in my purse. And he went into the uh, parking garage and she sat there um, kind of stunned with the security guard there who had seen the entire exchange. And she said, boy, that was an embarrassing moment, wasn't it? And he said, well, but it was very nice of Senator Levin to give your underwear back to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and with with that, of course, um, we did get the the sad news uh, yes. that, of course, uh, Senator Carl Levin passed away at the age of 87 last night. Um, and, you know, I've known him for a long time. I've interviewed him. I don't know how many times I've interviewed Carl Levin in the course of my career. Um and, and he, he was just one of those guys. I, I'm reading all these tributes to him today from every slice of the political world. And I've not seen one person have a bad thing to say about this guy. Nobody's saying, uh, you know, good riddance or anything like you would see with certain politicians and things like that. Everybody is genuinely saying wonderful things about him and they mean it, which is something that is so incredibly rare these days. A credit to Michigan, too, because um, when the Tea Party primaried um, his peer, uh, Dick Luger, um, in Indiana, there was quite a bit of that um, repulsive commentary. So, you know, I think that's a credit to Michigan. But you're right. He was a great guy. Everybody loved him. Um, he earned his reputation 
over the course of decades. And I just don't think there's enough good things we can say about him. But in this, I will defer to Susan because she's the expert on Michigan politics. <laughs> well, I mean, Susan, I, I, like I said, he was just an interesting guy and, and he always was informed about everything that was going on uh, at the Capitol. It's not like you could sit there and stump him on any issue. He had an opinion and a thought on how to make it better on just about everything. Yeah. I mean, the word statesman gets thrown around a lot. Uh, You know, he was pretty much the definition of that. And he really, you know, took pride in understanding policy and people and loved Michigan. You know, every six years, Republicans would make a huge deal. We're going to take out Carl Levin. He's too liberal. And it would never go anywhere because he was just beloved. He, He was. Go ahead, Alan. Uh, I'll say, I mean, growing up in Detroit, uh, being Jewish, uh, the Levin brothers were, you know, one of the really few high profile uh, Jews in public office. And so I always admired, you know, admired him for that. I I do have to say I have one minor, and I love Carl Levin. I have one minor little uh, criticism is that while we were on strike at the Detroit News, uh, him and his brother did talk to the Detroit News when the White House, the Clinton White House, had, had barred the Detroit News and Free Press from talking to anybody during the strike. And the Levin brothers did talk. And there, were, there was disappointment among the strikers. But that being said, you know, the Levin, the Levin family is, you know, it's, it's been great in terms of public service. And Carl was certainly among them. Yeah, well, again, 36 years in the U.S. Senate, preceded by uh, eight years on the Detroit City Council, including four years as city council president. Um, Pretty remarkable career when you're talking almost 50 years of public service uh, that he put in. And, you know, that says a lot. Like I said, between he and John Dingell, those are the two best arguments against term limits that I can think of. You know, people who are actually qualified to do their jobs, career politicians for sure. uh, But sometimes... We need career politicians like right now with with the bickering we're witnessing in Washington. You know who's getting something done in the Senate, whether you agree with this deal they made or not on this infrastructure thing. It's the career politicians, the guys who've been doing this a long time that have figured out a way to work together. And I mean, maybe we can step back and take a look at this and realize that this is not necessarily a bad thing to have people that are really good at their jobs. I wouldn't even qualify it with not necessarily. I would just say, you know, you do a job, you get better at it the longer you do it and you know you can understand kind of the argument um in favor of you know this kind of you know agrarian world where we we put down the plow like ed mcbroom and you know drive down to the big city and do our business and then after a few years we go back and pick up the plow again but that's not un- that's unrealistic and you know the, the united states is not it's not the 18th century anymore the united states is a large complex country the most powerful in the world for now and we need to um, we need people who know what the hell they're doing in washington lansing even the city council so in in michigan in the legislature you get paid about $70,000 a year there i have a real problem with that being the best paid job some of these folks will ever have. <laughs> I, I know. With some That's, weird incentives. Yeah. Yeah, that is that is very true. Um, you know, but uh, my days of covering the Capitol back in Lansing, uh, you know, go back to the days before term limits. And you had guys that were there for 30, 40 years in, in some of these places. And, you know, their constituents liked them. So they kept sending them back. So if you don't like them, vote them out. But if you send them back, let them go back. Anyway, I mean, I just wanted to say something about Carl Levin this morning just because he was a giant in Michigan. I mean, he was, you know, the glass is always at the end of the nose. You know, he's looked sort of like your gentle grandpa up there in the Senate until he starts grilling some guy from Goldman Sachs about something, you know. Uh, You know, I was watching some video footage of him yesterday where he was calling out these bankers and they just didn't know what to do. They had no responses to the questions that he had for them. They were just like, yep, you got me. (laughs) It's like, so he could he could do that to you. Um. And Imagine somebody like Mar- Marjorie Taylor Greene or Lauren Boebert doing that. I mean, it's just. Oh, we'll talk about them later on. OK, right. we will have a chance to talk about them a little bit later on. Dave, I just you know, I, I sprung the whole uh, uh, Carl Levin thing on everybody this morning. But um, well, you know, unfortunately, we learned it last night. But uh, any thoughts that you'd like to add about him? Because he was just a part of our political life from the time we were kids. Well, yeah. And a lot was covered already. But I, I was going to point out the fact that the career politician, you know, and, and us seeing the value in that we see it in the white house right now. Like 
how many years did we have infrastructure week? We had infrastructure <laughs> week for four years. And, uh, and now they're announcing that we actually have a deal in the most divided, you know, uh, country in America uh, to I mean, actually put something together. Well, there is a ways to go on this, but, you know, that was a bit of a surprise this week that we actually did get a compromise when about a week ago, everybody was saying it was likely dead. Um, and it's not going to be everything everybody wants. No. Everybody's going to be a little unhappy with some parts of this, but this is the way things used to get done. It's never been an all or nothing game in politics. And this is what people need to understand. They say they don't want incremental change, but that's the way things actually happen here. Most of the time, as long as you're making progress, Sometimes it's not fast enough on certain issues, obviously, but when it comes to something like infrastructure, everybody's happy because it means jobs and something they can bring back to their district and say, look, I'm working for you. And so, it has to get done, right? It has to get done. It's not a option anymore. Like we, we have bridges that fall down that, you know, we can't keep going the way we're going. And uh, what do they say about settlements or agreements? The best ones are always ones where everybody's a little disappointed, right? You right. know, like, Everybody had to take a little and give a little. Absolutely. Well, all right. Let's, you know, I didn't really want to get into the whole infrastructure thing because that's that's a long ways off and we don't know all the details yet. We'll get into that. But I do want to talk about something that did happen at the Capitol this week. And that was the first of the hearings looking into the January 6th insurrection. You had four uh, police officers. Uh, th I believe three were from the Capitol Police and one from the Metropolitan Police, or maybe it was two and two. Two, two, two and two. Two and two. And some of the testimony was just, you know, jaw dropping when you when you heard uh, the uh, Capitol Police officer talking about the racial slurs being thrown his way um, and just the, the lady in pink casually tossing out the N word. And, you know, for a lot of people had not heard those stories yet. And it was important. And I thought about this for just a second and I watched the hearing and I'm listening to the questions coming from both the two Republicans that are on this panel and the Democrats. And none of the bomb throwing from the Jim Jordans of the world that was out there meant to sort of, you know, distract us from this kind of thing. And I'm thinking Kevin McCarthy made a huge mistake when he withdrew his people from that panel because of the kicking off of Jim Jordan and Jim Banks. He made a huge mistake because now we're actually going to have people who are respectfully listening to the testimony, asking questions that matter without the sideshow shit show that those guys would have brought. And here's the thing. There's nobody defending Donald Trump up on, on that panel. Nobody. And I guarantee you Donald Trump is pissed off. He's like, where are my fans? They're not there. Kevin McCarthy screwed up big time because this is going to go on for weeks and it's just going to be something that makes him look worse and worse every single day. The Italian right. grandma strikes again. <laughs> exactly. Go ahead, Alan. I, I, I think, I mean, it's, we're, we're blessed that Jim Jordan is not on there. Oh, hell yeah. I was just say, I was watching the, I was watching the testimony. And I, I had a tear coming down. Uh, it was rolling down my cheeks. I, I just was, so, it was so painful to see this country uh, and these guys, law enforcement people facing really the clearly the deplorables, people who were, who were shouting the N word, people wearing the Auschwitz sweatshirts, people beating uh, cops trying to, you know, one guy was talking about how one guy was trying to gouge his eye out. Uh, and just, I, I mean, it's just so appalling. And, and these in the end, if you remember when Trump said, OK, Finally, he finally said, OK, go home now. But you're very special people. <laughs> wow. Wow. I, it's, it's, I, I, I remember wow. watching that. I, I, I have there are very few times in my life I can recall being as angry as I was after I watched Donald Trump make that half hast statement that day uh, when that was going on, what, four hours after it began. Yeah. And he's just like, oh, you're all wonderful people. But but please go home now, you know, drive home safely. Uh, you know, it's just. That's my line. <laughs> I, I know it is. That's that's why I was I was throwing it to you there, Alan. But um, but you know, it's just some of the things that we saw in this hearing um, were really really difficult. And and the Republicans, of course, they want to sweep this under the rug. They don't want the country thinking that these are their supporters and these are the type of people that they have in their tent right now. But they do, and they invited them in. And I'm sorry, they're going to be exposed. Uh, and, and I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing that this is going to happen. People need to see what America is becoming under this type of previous leadership that we have. I, I think I, I don't see how Donald Trump. I mean, I I'm I'm not an attorney. I'm not a prosecutor, but I can't see how they can't lay out a case of 
of indicting him. The U.S. attorney in D.C., who's now a, a good, solid Democrat, uh, I don't see how they can't put a case together. He sent the people there, and then he let it happen. He did not. He did nothing to intervene, uh, and you know he condoned it. He was he was part of the whole process. At minimum, obstruction for not sending in people, for not telling people to go home early on when he was urged to. Joe Biden came out and said, "You need to tell people to stop." He had phone calls from Congress members saying, "You need to tell them to stop." And it was Kevin McCarthy where he said, "Apparently, he says, well, apparently you're as angry as they are that you know the election was going." Did, you know, did you did did anybody uh, pay attention to kind of the MAGA channels when all of this is going on? Oh yeah. Um, the there were two things that stuck out. It was some woman somewhere. She's getting retweeted a lot, and it was uh, she referred to them as crisis actors. Mm-hmm. Um, and then she said essentially, "Fix her. It didn't happen. Um, if if this happened, why are we not seeing the um, your body cam?" Uh, footage if all this stuff is actually happening. And, and, you know, weren't we actually watching the body cam footage while the hearing was going on? <laughs> well, you know, she was talking about like the slurs and, and that oh. sort of thing. And I, I have to say, I did not watch it. I don't have cable anymore. So I had to kind of read about it afterwards. So, Well, Laura Ingram on her Fox News show was handing out trophies for dramatic performances uh, for the officers there. Um, and uh, you had Tucker Carlson basically doing the same Thank thing. And, and the whole crisis like actor that. nonsense, it, it just... They have been reduced to attacking the witnesses uh, because they don't have anything else to say about this. The victims, really. Well, exactly, Dave. And I mean, they have nothing else. This is all they can do is try to discredit them because they have nothing that they can say about this that 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 fits the narrative they were trying to pass off earlier, that this wasn't really a big deal. What what kind of what kind of station is that where all the hosts are mocking victims of crime? All of those people were victims. They were they were beaten. They were assaulted with sprays. They were all these kinds of things. They were victims of crime, and and Fox is mocking them. This go ahead, Susan. This argument about crisis actors really started to take hold after Sandy Hook, <laughs> when you had a classroom full of six year olds blown away by an AR fifteen. And you had Alex Jones, who at the time was considered the extreme fringe of the Republican Party on Infowars, came up with this idea. And it it was very popular. I mean, the parents of these murdered children are stalked to this day by crazy people who believe they are crisis actors. And, and and, And remember, Obama as president got on television and cried for children dying. And, and was mocked, oh, what a pussy, Obama's a pussy. And and here we go, nine years later, this is the mainstream idea of the Republican Party, that any time their constituents engage in extreme violence, that it just must be BS and they're crisis actors, because these are the people they embrace, this is their base. And you indeed have Donald Trump, according to reporting, calling the police officers pussies because blue lives matter so much. I mean, this is not just your typical, we're investigating something that went wrong, which is what government does. This is our country being on the brink of being torn apart. And you have a Republican party that's fairly unified in, in pushing us further down this road of insurrection. Yeah, yeah I, I don't disagree with that at all. It's it's sad to see where we've gotten to uh, in this regard, uh, because, you know, Fox News has a big audience and, and I know people that will only watch Fox News. And, and the fact that you're still giving a platform to people like Laura Ingram um, to peddle some of this stuff is just ridiculous. And, and I mean, she, yes, of course, she got some criticism, but nothing's really going to happen as long as the viewers are there and the advertising money comes in from the Mike Lindells of the world. They're not going to give a damn. Oh, um, they're they're. Uh, yeah. I think they they started rejecting Mike Lindell's uh, or no, Mike Lindell rejects Fox News. That was it. He's yeah. not spending yeah. any more money. They're not Fox doing enough. News. Yeah. Oh, there is a story about him in the Atlantic, by the way, that I think I everybody that. needs to read. <laughs> it was <laughs> scary stuff. Um, yeah. uh, you know, just a, as an aside here, I read it yesterday and I was like, Ooh, this dude is kind of creepy. And um, the writer is a conservative, so that's Amy yeah, Apple it, down, it, so. exactly. Um, you know, clearly yeah. a. A crisis actor, that writer. <laughs> but, <you> know, <laughs> clearly, the mental gymnastics that that these folks have to go through to 
get to something that they can accept. Like um, all of these police officers are, uh, they're, they're Antifa actually, you know, they, they, Antifa must've been started 15 years ago before they became cops and uh, ended up infiltrating the DC police and the uh, Capitol police so that just for this moment, they could be there to make uh, Donald Trump look bad. Yeah. You know, if, is, if that's uh, the case, you know, we should start recruiting Antifa for the CIA because they can infiltrate anything. <laughs> exactly. It's I mean, the most amazing the Kremlin down in a couple of weeks. It's like, we, it's <laughs> no like Hugo, Hugo Chavez uh, switching votes from beyond the grave. Oh, so don't yes. get me started on. Don't get okay. me started on the audits. <laughs> we don't have time for that today. Uh, who can although get Antifa to penetrate in the highest. The hierarchy in Iran were really. That's what I'm saying. You know, North Korea, Iran. I mean, Antifa can do everything, apparently. They're right. magic. Never underestimate, yeah. never underestimate the power of a socialist that, uh, you know, has the will. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, Dave Dave brings up a point, though, like the contortions that people are trying to go through to, you know, distract attention from the real story. That is the fact that a bunch of Trump loving MAGA people decided that they were going to try to overthrow the government. That's what happened that day. They're trying to distract from it any way they can. One of the ways they tried to do it the other day was to have the counter press conference. <laughs> in front of the Capitol. It was Louis Gohmert, Paul Gosar, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Lauren Boebert, and uh, oh, Matt Matt oh, and, uh, and Jim Jordan. Um, <laughs> we're all having a press conference to talk about the, the questions that weren't being asked, which, which they would have asked if they were there, which were like, well, how come Nancy Pelosi didn't have extra police? How come she wasn't prepared? Never mind that it's not her direct responsibility to make sure of the staffing levels there. That is something that uh, is handled in another place. It's not Nancy Pelosi's job. Um, but, you know, the question that I asked is, first, we'll talk about it getting shut down in a second. But if they're going to ask that question, right? Like, well, how come they weren't prepared? Well, then you have to answer the question. What did you know about what was going to go on? What did yeah. you know that made, you know, this why should she have thought that. about that, that this rally was going to turn violent? What is it about your people that we need to be worried about? What are you hearing? What did you get tipped off to? And a couple of these morons actually outed themselves this week. Mo Brooks, who is going to be my schmuck of the week, and I'll reiterate this again, but he announced that he was wearing body armor when he was at the Stop the Steel rally because he had been tipped off that some violent people were coming. That was before the stuff started happening. He didn't say anything to anybody about that. He didn't call anybody and say, hey, we might have some violent thugs coming to the Capitol. He was wearing freaking body armor. He announced that he said this on the radio. And then Jim Jordan admits on Fox News. Brett Baer finally got him to admit that he did talk to the president on January 6th about what was happening. And he tried to sort of get around it. Well, guess what? Those two morons just got themselves guaranteed subpoenas to testify in front of the very committee that they wanted to be a part of. So see ya, boys. We're in trouble. And it's going to be fun to watch. I watched but, the interview with Jim Jordan, and it was hysterical. And he kept saying, well, did you talk to the president today? I talked to the president all the time. Hundreds of times. Know, you know. It's, uh, you know. He's my best pal. But then uh, talk about their counter protests or their counter oh, okay. presser. Yes. Yeah. I got off. I love it. Some protesters came to protest this press conference, and one dude with a whistle shut the whole thing down and i mean i don't want to encourage other people to do this because it is super annoying if you're trying to cover a press conference and somebody's doing that but it was funny to see the whole thing just get sidetracked by one dude in a yellow shirt with a let's, whistle let's give credit to the women who are holding signs that calling matt gates a pedophile that were walking around behind the camera repeatedly Yes. Those are, you are you a pedophile? Pedophile. Yeah. Are you a pedophile? <laughs> that was good. Uh, the uh, the Trump uh, inflatable with the pedophiles for Trump on it. <laughs> <laughs> pretty good. I mean, good. It, it was it was pretty great. But I mean, talk about trying to counter program. First of all, this hearing is is a bad idea in the first yeah. place, right? And that's that's all this is. Um, but then not getting what you wanted out of it, instead getting ridicule and scorn. Uh, is great. And they've tried a couple of stunts this week. The other one, when they were like, you know, bitching about the masks, uh, the mask mandate in the house, Nancy Pelosi brings back the mask rule because the CDC saying it's time to mask up indoors, especially when you have a place where you've got people coming in from all over the country all the time, you know, so they, they protest and they try to stage this protest to walk over to the Senate where the Senate doesn't have those rules in place yet. Um, and so what are they going to break down the Senate doors to demand to speak to the Senate about the mask mandate in the House? What's the Senate going to do? What's the point of that? And on January 6th, the instructions were trying to break down the door of the Senate. So you may as well just do it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not a good image. You know, you're, you're onto something there, Susan. They, maybe they, they need an image consultant here because the idea of, you know, 
trying to force your way into the Senate doors is probably not a good one right now. <laughs> <laughs> PR 101. I mean, you know. Uh, all right. Let's let's talk masks for just a little bit, because we are seeing a situation where COVID is 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 really ravaging a number of states. Michigan, fortunately, um, seems to be missing a lot of this wave. But, you know, you can't take anything for granted. Uh, and now you've got, you know, governors in, in red states that are begging people to get vaccinated, uh, you know, and, and talking about mask mandates. Um, I, I thought this was interesting because local businesses now are starting to say enough get vaccinated don't come in and i wanted to ask dave about this one because the marble bar which is a pretty big venue uh in detroit said you know what yeah show a proof of vaccination uh and you can come in otherwise you can't um and and that's all and people are bitching up a storm like i'm never gonna go there again and to which i say you never went there to begin with (laughs) you know i guarantee it i saw those neck beards there's no way they've ever been to the marble (laughs) exactly but but i mean dave you know as as a as a restaurant (laughs) as a restaurant owner though and a bar owner i mean how difficult is it to navigate this space because you just don't know which your customers is going to go off on some sort of rant yeah and i think for them it's it's a much harder thing than it is for us we're a, a small more of a neighborhood bar um they are a venue. They have lots of people coming in. People are dancing close together. Um, I support them in in that decision. Uh, I think what they actually asked for was your vaccination card or proof of a negative test within 48 hours or something yeah. like that. So there is there is a way around it if you really want to go. But what I look at and and uh, I look at Marble Bar's decision and I say they have a duty to protect their employees there too. Right. You know, and and it's getting worse in Michigan. You can see the numbers slowly ticking up. And in the city of Detroit, it's one of the lower vaccination rates in the state of Michigan. So there is a danger there. Um, so, yeah, I support them. We haven't made that decision, but we're a small spot. Uh, both uh, Jen and I, who are the, the only employees of the bar right now, are uh, va- fully vaccinated, you know. Um, and we waited a little while before we took the masks off. We waited about three weeks after we were allowed to to see that everybody was comfortable. And we asked the community what they thought. Um, but, yeah, Marble Bar, they've got to do what's right for their employees or they're not going to be there. Go ahead, Nitz. I, I was just going to say part of the reason this is so troubling is because we're learning more about this new variant almost on a daily basis. Um, when we first started taking our masks off when, at the beginning of summer, the, um, the line was, go ahead, take them off. You can be around people who are sick. You may get infected, but it'll be an extremely mild infection. It's, you know, you're essentially protected from serious illness by this. Mm-hmm. Well, now they're finding that, uh, that, that it's much more transmissible than, than that even. And it's, it still protects against, the vaccination still protects against serious illness but it's much, it's easier to get, even if you are fully vaccinated than we believed before. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think part of the reason that people are kind of upset, confused, angry, whatever, is that the CDC is kind of saying, you know, the, the reason we kept calling this a novel coronavirus a year and a half ago is because it's brand new and we don't know. And all the, I mean, we have, we're still doing research on it. We're still learning. And, you know, I could, I don't want to be a pessimist, but I mean, I could see another wave of, you know, hospitalizations and so forth, particularly among the unvaccinated. It's happening. And, it's I mean, happening in, I'd say it's happening in other states in Florida, right? Yeah, We're I know, but I mean, 10,000 cases see, a day. Yeah, you might even see it with, with people who have been vaccinated. So I don't know. I mean, one of the reasons it's so frustrating for the, those of us who were vaccine eager is that we realized that if everybody had had run to get the shot as soon as they could, mm-hmm. we wouldn't be in this position. Right. Over. So I well, think we have to use, I, I was thinking of, a, I was talking with a friend about a campaign, get other people and we could say the Democrats don't want the Republicans to get that shot mm-hmm. because it'll be good for us. And I think that'll help. I think that'll spur things. I have one quick question for Dave. Those mm-hmm. red little things look like COVID spores. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only COVID getting spread around here. Okay, right? I, really, I was going to tell you, you might uh, put your mask on. 
Yeah, that's the yeah. fun size. That's fun size is what they call that. Um, <laughs> well, you know, right but, over but, your I mean, shoulder. But you look, you have this these emerging these states where you're having real spikes again. Places like Arkansas, places like Missouri. Oh, and and the health director in St. Louis County, Missouri, the other day was called some horrific names at a public hearing about masks and vaccinations. Um, and and he's from uh, originally from India. And like I said, some of the things coming his way at this meeting were just awful. People are responding to this in such a horrible way. Uh, and, you know, now you have the governor in Arkansas, Asa Hutchinson, um, came out the other day and said that we have a public health emergency in our state, but I'm not going to require masks and we're going to be wide open. <sighs> so what is the point of declaring a public emergency if you're not actually going to take any steps to deal with said emergency? I mean, they're cowards. They're just these political cowards. Afraid of what? Cowards. They're what are they afraid of? Saving people's they're lives? They're afraid of losing their jobs. That's all they give a shit about, you know? Look, the COVID did not have to be a political issue, but no. it was the full-throated choice of the Republican Party to make it as such. If, if this had happened maybe 20, 30 years ago, I don't think we'd be facing the same thing. But with everything being polarized from the jump, Closing businesses down, closing government functions down, wearing masks, all that was considered to be an infringement on freedom instead of just common sense and let's not die. We could have been done with the first wave in six weeks if people had just stayed home. Couldn't do that couldn't wear masks afterwards. The vaccination was going to be worse than COVID, even though nobody who's getting vaccinated is dying. It's all the people who won't get vaccinated. There's no proof for any of these conspiracy theories, but conspiracy theories don't need proof. And so time and time again, Republicans have made the wrong decisions. They are going to continue to. The frustrating thing, I think, for all of us after a year and a half of this, of staying home, of doing the right thing, of changing the way our businesses do things, of, of getting vaccinated as soon as we humanly could, is that how much longer do we all have to put up with this crap because of people who just won't do the basic human decency requirement of being alive? Right. And honestly, I mean, it, this isn't going to be over anytime soon. We've got the fall and winter coming up when we can't be outside and Michigan sucks. Well, it's, it's I, think the, I think the private sector is going to play a pretty big role in this. What does that say, Nancy? Let's see. You, you two can get vaccinated just like Trump did back in January. Yes, there you go. <laughs> no, but I, I think the private sector is going to play a big role in this. As soon as people are faced yes. with the idea of losing their paycheck or getting a shot, guess what? They're going to fold. Gonna uh, your shot. kid's not going to be able to go to college if he doesn't get vaccinated. I think think that's a good way to do it. Um, and and you know what? That's what it's going to take. You're going to have to make a choice. Do you want to make a living or or do you want to have your freedoms, man? Because you can be free to do whatever the hell you want. Just not work here if you're not vaccinated. There, there are people at Ford Hospital, I'm told, who are going to quit uh, because of the vaccine. Okay. They've, they've told people, good. this is my last month. Goodbye. Good. So, you know, yeah. they'll, they'll be back just yeah. in a different way. When, yeah. no. <laughs> when I, I like Alan's plan. I like Alan's plan. Tell him, you know, tell him that the Democrats don't want him to get it. That's, <laughs> I think that's the only way it works. <laughs> you know, that's right. That's right. This is your way to own the libs, everybody. Get vaccinated. Yeah. When I, that's a stop their I evil plan would... to reduce the number of Republican voters. See, see, the right. Democrats are going to, you know, lower Republican voters by having them all die off from coronavirus. Well, this Republicans just try to stop the vote, you know, so right. <laughs> yeah, at least two percent years ago. Um, I was doing a, a reported piece on a um, bill in the Michigan legislature, which fortunately did not advance um, to ban health care facilities from requiring employees to get flu shots, which is kind of used to be absolutely routine and nobody said a word about it. It was no big deal. And I asked him, why are you doing this? And he said, I don't like the word required. I just don't like that word. And it's like, you know, what? how do you reason with people who are that freaking thick in the, in the skull? You know, the idea that, that there's one thing that we can all do that can help everybody or, or you can just not, you, you can just say the whole Republican Party attitude on this is you can't make me. And well, I mean, but that, that's that's a five year old argument. It is. Yeah, make me. And argument. then, you know what? You know, what usually happens. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's what I meant. Thank you for the correction. <laughs> right. um, but usually what happens with a five year old is that they end up caving because mom and dad, you know, 
they rule right. the roost. And it's yeah. just like, you can't do that. Yes, I can. Watch me. Um, <laughs> and that's what jobs, that's what employers are going to be doing pretty right. soon. It starts at a young age. A friend of mine, when his kid was very young, he was probably about seven, eight years old. He was in the bathroom and they said, hurry up. And he yelled out, you're not the boss of my wiener. So, <laughs> that's what it's all come down to. <laughs> now, that's a story that I didn't think and I was going to hear today. <laughs> but I, I mean, I even, mean, Mc, even oh, McConnell ahead, says, yeah, even McConnell is saying he didn't anticipate that there would be hesitancy to get the vaccine. He never thought that would be the case. I mean, I don't. I don't know why when you are one of the leaders of a party that tells people lies constantly, you would think they might believe them, but, you know, uh, or wouldn't believe that they would believe them. But, well, yeah, even he says he, he has the unenviable that. task of trying to put the toothpaste back in the tube. Mm-hmm. Good he, luck, he Mitch. He looks like he's about to die one of these days himself. But anyway. he's, he's looked well, like that I, for a long time. I, oh, go ahead, Susan. You look like you well, M- Mitch McConnell had polio as a child, so he's oh, actually oh. very pro-vaccination yeah. and it would be great if there were more of them in his party. <laughs> may I may I do take the host chair for one second and do a well, sure, Nancy, go ahead. Because I, I, you said, you know, Susan said, who would have ever thought there was no reason that, that a pandemic should become a political issue? Who would have ever thought that an individual Olympic athlete's decision of you know to to withdraw from her sport could also become a political issue and yet if you look at the reaction to simone biles's uh decision to um, withdraw from the gymnastics competition it breaks down almost exclusively on political lines yeah, it, Isn't it is that the weirdest goddamn thing in the world and it's also revealing just totally not. sort of the worst the worst of us out there you know um the I always say never read the comment section, but I always do. Oh, um, and and I mean the reaction to Simone Biles is just, I, well, bileful is is the yeah. the word. It's yeah. just bilious is the word. You're bilious saying. would be. <laughs> okay. bilious, yeah. I mean, she but, was explaining that she's she's having something that happens to gymnasts where they lose type their, of vertigo. Yeah. Twisties, they call it. And, and and she said I was concerned about my physical safety, and so. It's, Did that it's, stop it's Mitch Albom cool. from it's, having his stupid, ill-informed, pulled out of his ass opinion about it and publishing it at great length in the Detroit Free Press? No. So. Hmm. <laughs> I, I, I knew that was coming. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, you know, look, here's the thing. What does she owe anybody? Right. She's already won how many Olympic golds before this time around. She actually retired and came out of retirement to compete again. She wasn't planning on being in the 2020 Olympics to begin with. Um and the team still got a silver medal. And now we have a new gold medal winner in the right. all around competition. And, and it's just like, I, I don't understand why this is such a big deal. She didn't quit on her team. She was probably going to harm her team if she competed because the expectations were so high. If she's landing the way she was in some of those early vaults, guess what? She's not going to score well. She's going to hurt the team. They might have gotten a bronze or been out of the medals entirely if she had actually competed, you know, I done do. the thing with all these. Go ahead. Why should she have to destroy her body, you know, at a young age because, you know, of other people's because she must entertain us. Right. <laughs> well, and, and somebody like Mitch Album says, well, you know, it's one thing to quit like, you know, before the game start. But in the middle of the games, it's that that would be like Tom Brady, you know, bowing out after the first snap in the Super Bowl. And it's like, you know, please, can you do that? Pointed, please? <laughs> many people pointed out that when Tom Brady is having a bad day at work, he throws interceptions. Um, when Simone Biles is having a bad day at work, she can she can end up in a wheelchair. She can she can kill herself for God's sake. I mean, yep. it's, it's a long shot, but it could happen. I mean, you know, she's you've seen some of these gymnasts. Well, she she was concerned about that. She Pardon was, me. I say she was concerned about that. About yes, exactly. Crippled or something. It's like screw the rest of the people. I mean, where you know, it's right. a sport. It's yes. it's simply that it's a sport. It's a nice. It's a it's a great sport, but it's just you know right. Well, and, and here was one of the things that, that was really uh, troubling for me is as I'm watching and everybody's like, well, remember when Carrie Strug did that vault when she had a broken leg and she was carried off by her coach? I'm like, yeah, Bella Caroli, the guy who looked the other way as uh, as Nasser was, you know, messing let me, with his let me victims. Turn you over to I mean, our team doctor, Carrie. Uh, it's Larry Nasser. Exactly. And, and it's just, you know, I'm like nothing about the gymnastics program right now is in a good place. It just yeah. isn't except for the athletes themselves, but they've got some answers that they still need to come up with. Uh, and it's just, it's awful. 
And if you and if now that we have Twitter and we can learn what Carrie Strug actually thinks about what Simone Biles did, she said, "Yep, she did the right thing. This is exactly what she <laughs> what she needed to do." Um, Dominique Mosianu, who was that other little pixie from the same year, who literally fell on her head Ooh, during yep. the balance beam mm-hmm. at the Olympics, said the exact mm-hmm. same thing. She said, they didn't even give me like a cervical spine check. It was just go take your seat and do the floor exercise in a few more minutes. I mean, it, it just, yeah. And the Bella Caroli, I mean, that guy, is, has he left the country or did he die? For some reason, I keep. I, I'm not sure the Caroli Ranch, uh, I, th- I believe, still it's, is out there, but um, but it's it's a nobody's training there anymore. I mean, I don't, with everything sure. that has happened in women's gymnastics over the last few years, this is the time for all of us to take a seat and shut up and let them talk, not us. Yeah. So. I, I would agree. Um, and, and Simone, Simone Biles, Biles has done a remarkable job for this country, and she doesn't owe anybody anything. No. Nope. Uh, let's let's come closer to home here. Um, Another Detroit City Council member accused of taking a bribe, Andre Spivey. $35,000 in bribes, apparently, is what the indictment says. Uh, We still don't know all the details about where it came from or what he was supposed to do in exchange for said money. But I was a little surprised when he decided not to run again. Well, now we know why. Now we know why. FBI has been investigating for about a year. He's known for a long time. Yeah, we we had actually known. uh, We were trying to get a a, a more uh, for a couple months, I, I was working on that with, with actually Violet, that story, having going around. Uh, I'm not sure we'll see the last of uh, anybody else. Uh, I mean, his chief of staff, I think, is is the other person involved. Uh, and, I mean, it's just, you know, it's funny. These judges give, like, Kwame Kilpatrick got 28 years, and part of the, the reason being it was supposed to be a deterrent. Uh, and yet... You, we see there there are no deterrence to greed. Like it was the people who are it's 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 in their DNA. They're going to do it when they get the opportunity. And you know the question becomes, and, and maybe we can all comment. I'd be curious. Is that I don't know what the salary is of the city council members. I think it's about seventy grand. Is is that? I think that's about right. Yeah. And, and the question is, would it help to if if their salaries were raised where they weren't more desperate for money, or would it not matter? And would we get a different grade? Uh, we, we get other people willing to to run for that. For the, I, I mean, you know, difference. you have a tough time convincing me that making seventy thousand dollars a year is being desperate for money, especially when the average income in the community that you serve is less than half of that. Uh, that's not an acceptable excuse. Uh, that they're underpaid job. because look, there are guys that get paid more than this that still commit these types of crimes. It, I don't think salary it level full, does it. It's a full time job. A lot of these people have advanced, you know, have law degrees and so forth, and are in professions that they would customarily make a lot more money. On the other hand, they choose to run for office. They choose this path, and I mean that's something that you need to consider before you make that decision. Is can I live on this? Salary, you know, do I have a spouse who can who can you know pull the weight for four years or however long I want to stay in in office? And so I, you know, what I find always kind of grimly humorous about these cases is um, if you if you watch the movies and you know you see movies about political corruption or or Die Hard or something like that, and it's like they're trying to steal like hundreds of millions of dollars, billions, <laughs> all the money right. in the world, you know, and yet in the real world, you can buy a city councilman for, you know, whatever, sure. Dave Leland, you know, like sausages. There exactly. been a case, there's yeah, been a case sausages. in Detroit where sausages were the stuff. Pennies on, <laughs> on the dollar. Right. Right. Exactly. Must have been some fine sausage. Um, but yeah, uh, I, you know, it's just, it's disappointing. Like I said, I, Worked for the city for four years, and I did a lot of work uh, with Andre Spivey, uh, you know, trying to help him with problems in the district and trying to come up with solutions to some of the blight issues and things like that in the neighborhood. And I had a good working relationship with the guy. I did. And his staff. And I'm just disappointed um, because, again, just another person, two, two in the last you know year that we've been that we're dealing with. And what is it? such a long history of this with Detroit City Council, though. Right. I was going to say, what does it tell us about the Detroit City Council? When we had, I mean, the most discreet, we had Charles Pugh as president, who suddenly became a fugitive in hiding. Uh, you know, we had uh, Monica Conyers. We had, I mean, we've had some pretty disgraceful, pretty low 
I, I don't understand why we're not getting better council members. Anymore. Well, uh, uh, we have to well, move on here. There are quick. some good ones now, but exactly. You know. I mean, there are some people that have done really, really good work yeah. on the city council over the years, and and have you know been good public servants. But like I said, bad public well, servants well, are not limited to the Detroit City Council no. by any stretch. No. <laughs> the Michigan Legislature has had its fair share of clowns over the years as well, and we've got one on full display right now. He has got the big red nose on. He's got the the rainbow colored wig. His name is Jewel Jones. He's been having a bad couple of weeks. Um, Susan, I mean, he was the youngest guy ever elected to the legislature, correct? Yeah. And we don't have a great history of younger lawmakers who get elected. And I'm, I'm not trying to um, uh, bag on the younger generation. I happen to have two uh, one adult child and one almost adult child and and they're they're wonderful but probably not ready for public office and so <laughs> there may be something to that yeah well i mean if you look at the things that he has done just recently um first of all the, the campaign funding uh, expenditure at the strip club is phenomenal the vanity I mean. life <laughs> The vanity license right. plate saying elected. I thought that the, was the best comment we had on our site was a guy said two what was it two hundred and twenty three dollars. He goes, oh my god, for somebody to get out of a strip club for only spending two hundred twenty three. <laughs> that's fiscal responsibility. He's well, got he couldn't he couldn't put the singles on the tab. You know that it doesn't work that way. So, um, uh, but you know, it just here's the thing though. I, for me, I think the thing that that was most egregious for him was was the way he dealt with his his drunk driving conviction you know this is something you're supposed to take seriously probation testing all that kind of stuff these are things you take seriously or else you get in a whole lot of trouble he didn't pay the bill for the monitoring service so they shut it off that is a big red flag to the judge that you're not doing what you're supposed to do then of course he said well i can't be monitored because i have to go up to camp grayling uh, for military service, because he did serve in the military when he was young, and he's apparently in the reserves. And he said he was being called up to Camp Grayling for training exercises. But he was in-house committee meetings, the same dates he says he was there and he couldn't be monitored. And also, he was like tweeting pictures of himself on social media, clearly not at the Capitol or at Camp Grayling, at the time <laughs> that he told the judge that he couldn't be monitored. And so, you know, I, I'm not, I'm surprised that he is not facing potential jail time over this right now for the violations of, of that probation. I mean, it's uh, actually right. the chief of his bond. He's not even, he hasn't even been um, sentenced yet. So uh, he's making some bad decisions. What, what County did he get arrested in? I think it was it Livingston, Livingston. Wasn't it? Livingston? Oh boy. The Livingston yeah. County jail. And I don't know. That's a place I would want to be. As an yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I mean, you know, but just the hubris and then, yeah, the campaign finance reports. Don't, yeah. He's like, well, sometimes you got to meet people where they are. I'm like, oh, I suppose. With the, with the hashtag, holla. <laughs> <Yeah. Hello. laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of the folks that think they're being uh, injected with a, a 5G that the government can monitor them while they're carrying around their cell phone constantly be monitored. By uh, he's, he's saying, I, I can't be monitored. And yet, yet he's I, I, monitoring I think himself, we, you know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, but that's, that's just arrogance, arrogance and stupidity mixed. Um, you know, a, a little, yeah. a little tool of the trade is that when you go to the strip club, you call it single mother outreach. <laughs> <laughs> done before. <laughs> oh, constituent relations. There you go. Um, all right. All right. We should, we should probably move on. Oh, I, I want to talk about this one. Um, Governor Whitmer making some serious coin right now for her campaign, like $10 million or something in the last reporting period. I mean, she's got like 10 million in her war chest and she's taking advantage of a ruling made by, uh, uh, by um, uh, Frank Kelly a long time ago, suggesting uh, the former attorney general saying that, Hey, look, if you're facing a recall effort, you can raise unlimited campaign cash. And so there are what six different ones that are out there. Some are actively collecting signatures. Most aren't, they're dormant, but they're still open. And she's taking mm -hmm. advantage of it. And the Republicans are like, hey, wait, that's not fair. It's like, well, you know what? I guarantee if they were the ones in charge, they would be doing the same thing and not saying a word about it. Uh, but no. good on Gretchen Whitmer for taking advantage of this of this loophole in the law. It doesn't look great. But at the same time, you know, money is money. Money is money. And, and you know, like I said, it's and amazing it's to me that the only time Republicans care about campaign finance reform is when they're getting outraised. 
Well, Rick <laughs> Snyder had recall efforts against him and nobody cared because, you know, he Term limited. Well fund everything. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So it wasn't a big deal then. But, you know, because Gretchen Whitmer, you know, is not a multimillionaire. Um, apparently, this was not something Republicans anticipated having to fight, which perhaps is why you're hearing so many things about this Republican businessman might run because he can self fund or Betsy DeVos, the most unpopular person in Michigan, who has, you know, billions of dollars, of course. Yes, <laughs> please absolutely. Run, Betsy, please. Um, I, I, you know, but... <sighs> OK, I understand why people might say this is kind of a sneaky way to do it. But, hey, it, it is on the books. And, and you know, if you're going to threaten somebody with a recall, go through with it or don't, uh, because now this is just going to keep going on. So just, you know, it's, it's a lot of empty threats with recall threats because you're not going to be able to get the votes you need. But all you're doing now is enabling your opponent to strengthen uh, their position, fortify you know, the I base. think it's interesting about this one, though, is that there's a fair number of uh, Republicans who still are in the sanity coalition who are saying she's game in this system and we need to call these, you know, call this off because, and then, cause, she, cause, and shut that door for her. But there's this one guy in, I read in the Craig Mauger story in the news yesterday. He's like, no, I'm going to pull it out. You know, he's got like, I have a moral like obligation. A, yeah. yeah he's he's like, I'm morally like obligated. Like the the meeting. Yeah. You know? exactly. He's a true believer. Yeah. He's a true believer. <sighs> And it kind of ties in with this Politico story um, this morning about how the Michigan Republican Party is tearing itself apart over this, you know, the Trump, the the big lie, and and this other. So it's kind of like I'm. What is, who was the general or was it Sun Tzu or Napoleon who said when your enemy is destroying himself, let him? I mean, that's kind yeah. of that. I I feel like that's kind of what the state of the party right now. I know. Are we to believe that the Republicans aren't raising money off of the recall Whitmer, you know, hashtag recall Whitmer stuff, too? Oh, they're, they're, I mean, I mean yeah, you fundraise where you can. I mean, you know, yeah. I always thought those those stories that always come out over, you know, well, Trump says one thing, but he's sending out emails, you know, fundraising off of it. It's like big deal. Everybody does that. But, you know, mm. so. well, I'll tell you what. I mean, the, this guy, if this guy was smart, this true believer. Um, he would stop uh, allowing her to basically um, raise unlimited funds because <laughs> she's just going to keep raking it in. Uh, and it's, and you know, and here's the other thing too. The election's next year. Knock off the right. recall crap. You got a chance to knock her off next year. Take advantage of that. Shut off the spigot right now. And then, you know, yeah. get to getting your own dirty money. So yeah. something to think about. Okay. All right. We've got about six minutes left, which means to me, I think it's about time to get to, uh, our regular feature on this program. And now it's time for Deadline Detroit's nominees for Schmuck of the Week. Now I kind of blew my schmuck a little bit early here, uh, which is fine, um, and uh, because I, I put it out there, and I, I've got another one I think I can go to and maybe go a little bit more in depth on. But um, we'll let somebody else go first. Uh, Alan Langle, why don't you lead us off today? You know what? We kind of I I. I Plan on Laura Ingram just for for her mockery. Well, of again, remind us of her egregious behavior this week. That apparently, she uh, was mocking uh, the people, the officers who testified, and I just, I just find the the Fox just does so much disgusting stuff. I mean, between her and Tucker Carlson, uh, I, I, just, I just think it's criminal what what they do. I mean, it's it's really almost, almost the equivalency of the Holocaust deniers. Like, didn't happen. What are you talking about? So, uh, yeah. it's disturbing. Mm. All right. That's not a bad one. Um, you know, like I said, I, I that was such an important part of the discussion that we had at the beginning that I figured it was probably going to show up at some point. But, you know, again, despicable behavior in, in any way attacking these officers who probably saved a lot of people's lives that day. Something to think about. Uh, who wants to go next? How about Susan today? Um, I will go with Mike Shirky, the Michigan Senate Majority Leader. And you may be asking why, because you may have your own reasons. Not, not really. <laughs> <laughs> um, but There's this, no shortage. <laughs> um, I, I will go with, I mean, he is one of the proudly unvaccinated members of the Michigan legislature. Let's face it, on the Republican side, he's well in the majority. We all know that. Um, 
which is a, a would be, in my estimation, would qualify for the CDC recommendation for, you know, a place to wear a mask. Just a little tip. Um, but, you know, not only has he been extremely hostile, spreading misinformation that, well, I've had COVID, so I'm immune because he's a doctor. And of course, you know, no doctor will tell you that you're immune forever and ever. But, you know, perhaps, you know, he, he knows otherwise. But beyond that, you know, Gretchen Whitmer has been trying to bend over backwards along with some leaders, you know, with this, this lottery style raffle trying to get up to 70%, even though it, it, it doesn't, you know, appear to be happening anytime soon. You know, we're not Vermont or San Francisco, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, he just has told the media point blank, I don't support any of this. It's coercion. It's awful. This is the best thing we can do for people's health and because we all know that he doesn't really care for the economy, because this is how we're going to keep everything open and kicking, whether or not things ever get shut down again. People self-select out. They will stop going to bars and restaurants. They will stop supporting our economy. And so that is why it's so important to get vaccinated for, you know, that big economic argument that Republicans are supposed to be on board for. So for him to continue this when even people like Stephen Scalise have finally gotten vaccinated, schmuck of the week. Good one. Very good. I like it. I like it. And well, just well explained too. You know, I love that. Uh, Dave Frasetto. I was, uh, I was going to go with Matt Gates just because he's got the world's most punchable face. Um, but <laughs> yeah, Ted Cruz there too. need to go like, think, you know, three rounds. Head three to rounds head. Yeah. Good. Yeah, who's more uh, punchable? Aaron, Aaron Reitz, is it? Reitz, uh, the uh, assistant attorney general in Texas, who describes Simone Biles as a national embarrassment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then, of course, had, yes. to, had to apologize. Right, right. Because you know he meant that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think that's pretty good. Uh, he was he was right up there on my list. Um, and and again, just the reaction to that is is showing me the worst side of humanity. Uh, you know, how old is Simone Biles? 24, 24 and 24. also a, a resident of Houston, Texas, too. Yeah, yeah one of his own constituents. So, yeah, yeah mm-hmm. that's amazing. Well, look, the Texas Attorney General's office has been in there, what, twice in the last two weeks, if I'm not mistaken? Because mm-hmm. I had him on for charging that guy for the voter fraud stuff. Uh, what is that, two weeks ago, I think I did. So good on you, Texas. You keep finding ways <laughs> onto the list. Um, Nancy, Making Florida look less bad. There, there you go. <laughs> Nancy Derringer. Um, I'm going with J.D. Vance. Uh, J.D. Vance from, uh, as, a, as a native Ohioan, I feel like I have to fly the flag for what's left of my state. It has gone completely bonkers. And, and remind very, people who J.D. Vance is. J.D. Vance uh, at one time was considered the an intellectual thought leader in the Republican Party. Um, he wrote this book called Hillbilly Elegy, which you may remember from the bestseller lists or from the Netflix queue because it was adapted um, into a, um, a movie, and it was—it's uh, basically his his memoir about growing up in Middletown, Ohio, which he describes as Appalachia. It's not, <laughs> but you know, this in this kind of blue collar, um, working class, hard scrabble life, um, because his mother was a out of control addict, and you know, it's, it's essentially saying you got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. He, he eventually enlisted in the army and then he went to Yale law school and now he works or he worked in venture capital, but he's running for Senate. He's running for the Senate Republican nomination in Ohio. And he is trailing badly to one of the worst can to a candidate who is even worse than him. This guy named Josh <laughs> Mandel, who is just absolutely terrible. He's so awful that the Cleveland uh, plane dealer, I think it's Cleveland.com now said they were not going to cover him anymore. He just, all he does is he's like a, he's like a, um, he's kind of a Matt Gates type in that he just, he never speaks seriously. He's always just like trolling for attention. Um, he is way out ahead of the field and JD Vance is like, you know, sucking his hind tailpipe. And so he's trying to become more like him. And so he's gone from this, you know, Republican intellectual <laughs> thought leader, you know, the kind of guy who's on, who's got a best selling book to basically a bomb thrower. You know, he, uh, he, he's, his latest thing is that he believes that the childless left is ruining the country, the childless left. Now I have a child, Susan has two. 
Um, you've got one. You've got two, Dave. All right, I, I have some real left. I think so. It's Lengel's fault. It's Lengel's fault <laughs> over here. He's ruining the country. But I mean, it's just it's so offensive. And when somebody made some, I, I think uh, Paul Krugman tweeted something about how um, he he said it's funny how you should you should be pro natalist, but you don't mention Biden's child tax credit, which is going to really help a lot of people with their child rearing expenses and and he called him a crazy cat lady which is like you don't call paul Krugman. he's won the freaking nobel prize for god's sake you know you don't call it a cat lady unless you're trying to be more like trump so you know from from the heights to the to the bottom of the barrel in record time jd vance my schmuck of the week all right. Well, I've got one more. And this actually, this is a three headed. This is the Hydra of schmucks uh, in that I've got Matt Gates, Marjorie Taylor Greene and Louis Gohmert. Now, yeah. of course, they already had the failed press conference earlier oh, in the week. Insane. Then they did the failed. Then they did the failed, uh, um, you know, walk over to the Senate chamber. And then here's the one they tried to pull off the other day, which is the ultimate insulting BS. So they go to visit the federal prison on Thursday to check on the condition of those that are in jail because they participated in the riot on January 6th at the U S Capitol to go check on the condition of the quote, political prisoners. Are you, are you getting enough bologna sandwiches guys? <laughs> <laughs> and they show up and they demand, they demand a visit because they think that they're being somehow mistreated in the holding cells that they're in. Uh, and, and I'm thinking to myself, you know what? You know what? Get all of these people on the stand, every single one of them, because there are rumors out there that they may have been you know, giving people tours of the Capitol the day before and saying, well, here's where the tunnels go to get from one place to the other. And, you know, I, I don't know if that's true and I'm not going to suggest that it is, but I would love to ask them just to make them uncomfortable for a little yes, while. It would be fun. They were. And, and one of them was was a Bobert or Green who was tweeting the. Uh, Nancy Pelosi has been taken to the whatever room during right, the riot right. as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, so. I think there's some splaining to do, yeah. Lucy. Um, and I hopefully hope we'll that, get to I that. I hope the inmates like offered some prison hooch to them. You know, the, the, I always think of that that funny movie, Let's Go to Prison. I make it in the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. We've got to wrap things up here today. Uh, I want to thank my guests. Uh, Alan Lengel, of course, is the editor and co-founder of Deadline Detroit. And Alan, uh, you have the sign behind you that says Free Fenster. Uh, we got an update this week, but still no uh, closer to a resolution. Uh, not yet. I mean, it's there was a hearing on Monday. I mean, these hearings are really just so perfunctory. I mean, they're like five, ten minutes. They sent them back to the cell. Apparently, there was a riot in the cell on the women's side. Uh, because of the conditions and because COVID was spreading so crazy, you know, it was so crazy and the military came in uh, to the prison. Uh, he's got another hearing on the 9th or the, I think the somewhere around August the 9th, give or take. And, and the family has a phone call scheduled mm -hmm. for, I think it's Monday, Sunday or Monday. Uh, but there's still, you know, it's been over two months now. I mean, it's just, I mean, here's a guy who was just an editor editing stories and and they snatched them and now they've got them you know and and he had some covid symptoms he probably had covid the covid is running crazy through there the country is just in total chaos uh they're they're trying to use the military is trying to use the covid as a way to tell people stay off the streets it's dangerous but people are protesting and and, and some of the medical people don't you know uh doctors and nurses they don't want to work for the military They've been arrested and killed. It's just, it's just insanity there. Well, hopefully, well, Fenster. Hopefully, he's Fenster. you know exactly, yeah. exactly, and and maybe we'll see some resolution there. But thanks, Alan. Appreciate it as always. Uh, Nancy Derringer, of course, from Deadline Detroit yeah. as well. Check out her newsletter, uh, which goes out every Wednesday. The Deadline Detroit newsletter. You can sign up at deadlinedetroit.com. It's always good. Uh, thanks to Susan Demas again from the Michigan advance for being with us. And again, I love your coverage up there. You, you bring a lot of important issues to light. And I want to let folks know, uh, Allison Donahue is one of the reporters at, of course, Michigan advance. I interviewed her for my podcast this week to talk about a rather strange abortion bill. That's not rooted in any real science at all. Uh, that is making its way to a state house near you. 
20 states already, Michigan being the latest one. And it's important for people to know that this stuff is going on. So go back and check out that uh, podcast because um, Allison did a great job. And again, I only knew about it because I read the Michigan advance. So thank you, Susan. Appreciate your help. And also Dave Frasetto, again, owner of the Lexington on Trumbull Street, just south of I-94, right there uh, in the Woodbridge neighborhood in Detroit. Uh, go on in. They make a mean cocktail and a really excellent porch in the back, too. Got to say. Congratulations, <laughs> Thank you David. Very much. Thanks, All right, thanks for being with us. Uh, thanks to Lynette Shrimp House for sponsoring the show and DeadlineDetroit.com. And also become a member at DeadlineDetroit.com. DeadlineDetroit.com slash membership, three bucks a month. We just announced our prize winners for this month. Uh, today there, you can see if maybe it was one of your friends that got it. But we appreciate the support, uh, and we appreciate the fact that you watch, listen, read, all the stuff that we are doing for you all the time at Deadline Detroit, seven days a week. So thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend. And, Alan, drive home safely. The Craig Fawley Show on Deadline Detroit is made possible in part by Lynette's Shrimp House, located in Highland Park. It's Metro Detroit's premier destination, serving juicy fried shrimp, fish, and wings alongside soul food sides and new additions to the menu like turkey tacos and desserts. Located at 13548 Woodward in Highland Park, just north of the Davidson, Lynette's is open for takeaway noon to 8, Tuesday and Thursday, noon to 10 p.m. Friday and Saturday, and noon to 5 p.m. on Sunday. Call now, get some Lynette's.